fascinating phenomenon. There's a lot of them around the country, but not very really many of them survived. What's kind of special about it is that at the time it was set up, it brought together people from different disciplines. Research in uh, archaeology, there'd be classicists, there'd be what in those days would have been called natural philosophers that we would call physicists. There were surgeons, while the universities were becoming more specialised, that this, in a kind of private context, was allowed to happen. And in that sense, the institution is a kind of mythogeographical one. Ash Polly, I beg to show it at every station we've stopped at, all the way from London. I'm sorry, madam, but we have to keep a check on travellers nowadays. Oh, perhaps you think I'm a parachutist. Perhaps you'd like to look at those parcels, see if I've got a bicycle or machine gun. Uh, we take signs for granted, I think, because we don't really read them for the story that they're telling. We kind of read a generalised command. If you attempt to levitate, God will strike you with his silver arrow. Are you being punished for um, defying gravity? A group of us are arrived here. It was a night walk. And one of the walkers got kind of detached off the back and eventually caught us up. She actually told me that what had happened was that she'd reached this spot, which at that time had a, just an ordinary traffic roundabout on it. But in the middle of it were these little kind of stand, miniature standing stones, like it was a little sort of um, a model Stonehenge. And when she'd got to it, she'd had this tremendous sense of, um, of rushing water or rising water. About a year later I happened to mention this to somebody and uh, they said oh yes that area had been flooded very severely when the River Lemon rose and uh, burst its banks and that she'd seen across the waters of this traffic roundabout her true love. Oh hello And there was a man talking on a mobile and he sort of stopped his conversation because he said, your label is out. I said, yeah, it's meant to be. Um, it's not a clothing label. And it was a picture of a, a sardine. And that's when he said, I know you, don't I? And I said, oh, OK. And, and what's your name? And then he wouldn't tell me. And, um, and he just walked away. I'm going to try and get us into Tynmouth now and uh, maybe we could do some, um, it would be nice to do some secret filming on the pier, let's not ask any permissions and, um, and we can play the zombie game. I was thinking when they stick Flag of St George and stuff up on these things, it makes them look as if they're under siege. Who are they trying to repel? I really don't like these um, uh, these rides. I can't really cope with them. I don't know. It's just something a sort of physical thing. But um, I did go on one of those things that go round and round and round like that, and then slowly lift up, and then kind of go up. And that wasn't a physical experience at all. That was a psychological experience where the whole of my subconscious leapt into the top of my head, which is a very, very peculiar experience. But quite, I didn't mind that sort of too bad, too much. It's more the sort of jolting I don't like. So I'm kind of seeing it now, seeing the kind of the pier through these sort of blood red uh, kind of window things I've got here is a um, memory of massive, massive fair, and I could hear these screams and cries. It was at night, and there was, it was all this light, this red and orange, and it was just this image of, of of kind of what I think medieval people thought hell was like. Morally exhausting. <laughs> One of the things that doesn't really get talked about too much around here is the story of Donald Crowhurst. He was a kind of round the world uh, yachtsman and he set out from here on a boat called the Timmouth Electron because he took with him a copy of uh, Einstein's 
general theory of relativity and essentially he began to feel that he could personally and physically experience the effects of relativity and then he really went into a strange metaphysical place. His last words in the logbook were, it is the mercy. He took, picked up the chronometer the, on the boat and stepped off the back. About five years ago, four years ago, there was a big workshop set up. A guy was building another boat to go around the world and he put on this huge display of shipping and, and, and fishing and all the trades here. In that whole exhibition there was no mention of Donald Crowhurst. It, it blighted that whole project. The guy's whole kind of business empire, which had various nightclubs all over, collapsed and the boat never sailed. forget the name of this plant. It's kind of cross between a giant hogweed and rhubarb. What I really like about it is when it rots, it kind of crumples. It looks like the final shot of the defeat of the monster in the giant spider invasion. When it's in its present state, it's it's one of those um, well, it's one of those alien invaders. You see these government leaflets telling you that you're not allowed to do certain things with Japanese knotweed, which I kind of object to. So I'm afraid I have to confess that I do secretly take seeds from Himalayan balsam, which grows to about 12 feet, and I plant them on the outskirts of supermarkets. The shrubs around supermarkets never grow higher than about two and a half feet, and so they don't need to be maintained. So I'm trying to subvert them, to disrupt, I want to make them maintain their gardens rather than just plant them and leave them. They came from another world to destroy the earth. 